The landing force will proceed westward, out of Midway's air range. The Japanese had been defeated, and it was time to cut their losses. Yamamoto continued hurrying east with the main body to meet up with the shattered remnants of Nagumo's force. Of all the Japanese formations now in the vicinity of Midway, Admiral Kurita's four cruisers were by far the most exposed. They had been racing east, led by Kumano, with her sisters Suzuya, Mikuma and Mogami in train, destroyers Asashio and Arashio, as well as the oiler that had been accompanying them, had long since been left behind. Cruiser Division 7 contained four of the swiftest ships in the Japanese inventory, capable of knocking down 35 knots. They were using a healthy dose of that speed now. Each was heavily armed as well, sporting 10 8-inch guns and a lethal battery of 12 24-inch torpedo tubes. They could inflict enormous harm on Midway's airfield if they could get within range by 10.45 p.m. Midway was tantalizingly close. Unfortunately for Kurita, Yamamoto's orders cancelling the bombardment mission had mistakenly been first sent to Cruiser Division 8, not Cruiser Division 7, resulting in a delay of more than two hours before he finally received them about 2.30 a.m. By this time, Midway was less than 50 nautical miles away. To the men on Kumano's bridge, the order was a bitter disappointment. They had come so far, only to have to turn about at the last moment having no choice. However, Kurita ordered his force to a new course to the northwest, to close on the main body. At 2.15 a.m., Kurita's force was sighted by the American submarine Tambor, which was surfaced in her patrol area. Tambor noted an unidentified force to the south of its position, composed of four large ships bearing 279 true from Midway, course about 50 degrees. Having been warned that United States ships might be in the area, Lieutenant Commander John W. Murphy came south, paralleling and shadowing them, but hesitating to radio a notice while still trying to identify the ships. Shortly after, Tamba temporarily lost contact in the gloom. At 2.38am, though, the submarine found her quarry again, noting with surprise that the ships now appeared headed north toward her. It was true. Just before this, Kurita had finally received the mistransmitted recall order, and at 2.30am commenced to change course to break off to the north. This sent his four swift cruisers heading directly toward the skulking Tambor. However, almost immediately a sharp-eyed lookout on board Kumano sighted the American submarine ahead and to port of the Japanese column. The flagship immediately flashed the warning AKA, AKA, red, red, down the line, ordering an evasive turn in echelon to port. Moving at high speed, Kurita's squadron was thrown into confusion. Kumano cut very sharply to port, heading almost due west, before rounding back to a northwest course. Behind her, Suzuya only turned about 45 degrees, and quickly found herself closing on the flagship. She swerved to starboard, cutting across Kumano's wake, and barely missing her astern. Next in line astern, Mikuma conformed to Suzuya's movements, finding herself off Suzuya's port beam. Seeing Suzuya veering away to starboard to avoid ramming Kumano, Mikuma likewise adjusted her own course more to the west to avoid becoming entangled with the flagship. In doing so, though, she brought herself directly into the path of the southernmost cruiser, Mogami. Mogami had sheered out of line very sharply to port, then watched as the rest of the formation appeared to be making off to the northwest leaving her behind. Her skipper, Captain Soji Akira, thereupon corrected her course yet again, turning back to starboard to head more to the northwest in pursuit of the flagship. It was at this moment that Mikuma suddenly hove into sight, crossing Mogami's bow right to left. At the last second, Soji attempted to turn back to port, but it was too late. Mikuma's captain, Sakiyama Shakao, did not see his sister ship coming up from the south, and held course due west until almost the last second. So it was that Mogami, still desperately turning to port to avoid the unavoidable, rammed Mikuma almost directly under her bridge. The blow was glancing as such things go, Captain Soji's last second manoeuvring at least resulted in Mogami's hitting her sister fairly obliquely. Nevertheless, the impact of a 13,000-ton cruiser travelling at 28 knots could not help but be calamitous,
Amid the cacophonous shrieking of tearing steel, Mogami's thin, graceful bow ground itself to destruction on Mikuma's heavy armour belt. By the time her forward momentum was fully checked, Mogami's prow had been spectacularly crumpled all the way back to the number one main turret. What remained was forty feet shorter and wrenched almost perpendicularly to port. Mogami lay dead in the water, drifting backward from Mikuma. Mikuma's damage was fairly minor. Her plating was stove in around the wound, but the majority of the damage was above the waterline. However, a fuel tank next to boiler room number four was leaking oil from a gash twenty metres long and six metres wide. Other smaller gashes could be seen below the number two five-inch gun mount and the mainmast. There was no other option except for both ships to get back up to speed as best they could and make their way out of the area. Admiral Kurita reluctantly ordered Kumano and Suzuya ahead at high speed. Mikuma was detached to escort Mogami out of the battlefield. Kurita radioed for Destroyer Division 8 to come east and meet the lagging pair. The best speed Mogami could do was 12 knots, and even at this slow pace she handled like a barge. Limping away less than a hundred miles away from an enemy base, the odds were not good for her survival. Japanese damage control, as we have seen, was often far from exemplary, yet on this occasion Mogami's damage control officer, Lieutenant Commander Saruwatari Masayushi, displayed an acumen that would have made any navy proud. He rallied the disoriented repair parties in the bow area and oversaw the shoring up of the watertight compartments in the area. If his ship was going to be rammed bent proud into a seaway, she would need all the stiffening she could get. Next, he ordered the jettisoning of every piece of inflammable material that could be found, almost heretically, in a navy that exalted firepower above all other things. This included the cruiser's torpedoes. Mogami carried 24 Type 93s. Each of these 30-foot monsters was equipped with a 1,080-pound explosive charge, the largest, most lethal torpedo warhead in the world. Being powered by pure oxygen, everyone was filled with enough oxidant and kerosene fuel to escalate almost any fire into a catastrophic inferno. If they were attacked by aircraft, and any fool could tell that they were likely to be on the receiving end of such unwanted attentions. Once the sun rose, a bomb hitting amidships would have the potential of igniting a total of 12 tonnes of high explosives, 24,000 litres of compressed oxygen, and a couple tonnes of kerosene to boot. Accordingly, Saruwatari summarily consigned the Type 93s to the deep. Mikuma's damage control officer, however, judged that since her own damage was slight, she would be best served by retaining her Type 93s. The comparative wisdom of these two decisions would be graphically demonstrated over the following days. Meanwhile, out in the gloom, Tambor remained blissfully ignorant of the havoc she had caused, and even the identity of the prey she had stalked. At 2.51am, Tambor noted the strange ships had changed course even farther to the west from their northerly heading after which she lost contact. It was not until 3am that Lieutenant Commander Murphy finally got off a contact report to Pearl Harbor and Midway. Worse yet, his report was incredibly vague, since the unidentified vessels had been moving at high speed and changing direction several times. Murphy was reluctant to give a course for them, and reported only many ships. Nor did he even suggest that they might have been enemy vessels, it was not until 4.37am that Murphy finally confirmed that the many ships in question were, in fact, enemy cruisers. This tardiness was soon to cause great frustration for Admiral Spruance. In the meantime, another submarine, this one Japanese, was also at work off Midway. Unlike Cruiser Division 7, no one had bothered getting word to I-168 that the bombardment mission was now off. Lieutenant Commander Tanabe duly surfaced his vessel off the east side of the lagoon at 1.20am and let fly with a few rounds. It wasn't long, however, before the marine gunners made out the low silhouette of the Japanese sub and began answering back. When the searchlights flipped on, pinning Tanabe's sub in their beams, he decided that that was enough for one night and submerged again. His eight rounds landed mostly in the lagoon and caused no damage to the American base, However, his shelling certainly rattled the American defenders. They had no way of knowing what the next day would bring and whether they might have Japanese battle wagons parked on their doorstep in the morning.
Even before Tanabe's visit, Midway had already been a hive of activity. The island was in a shambles, with bombed installations and the destruction from Tomonaga's morning attack still in evidence everywhere. The fuel tanks on Sand Island had continued to blaze well into the night, meaning that refueling the base's B-17s was proceeding laboriously by hand. Indeed, even as Tanabe was shelling the island, Midway still had combat aircraft in the air. These were not patrol aircraft, but rather a squadron of dive bombers. Some eight hours earlier, at 5pm, a patrolling PBY had reported three burning carriers to the northwest of the island. Though it had been drawing close to sundown, Captain Cyril Simard ordered his base's remaining attack aircraft into action. He designated Major Benjamin Norris, who had taken command of Lofton Henderson's Marine Scout Bombing Squadron 241, to lead out his aircraft six Scout Bomber Douglas and six of the older Scout Bomber 2U. However, Norris, mindful of the toll Zeros had extracted previously, opted for a night attack, with he and his men taking off at 7.15pm. Two hours later, Simard ordered Midway's eight-strong PT boat squadron to proceed to the same area. Neither mission was successful. Norris and his squadron found the sea empty, Carga having sunk just ten minutes after they had taken off from Midway. The weather had closed down in the interim, and the marine aviators found themselves battling squalls and a low overcast in pitch darkness on the way home. Major Norris now paid the price for requesting a night mission, as he apparently became disoriented in the gloom. His squadron members suddenly noticed that their commander had banked into a sharp descent. His squadron followed him from 10,000 feet down to a mere 500, then broke off when they saw what was coming. Norris and his plane were never seen again. Some of Norris's men became lost on the way back to base, and the last of them didn't land until 1.45 a.m., the PT boats, too, spent a long, fruitless evening chasing around in search of Japanese vessels that had already sunk. At 2.30am, even as he was wondering what to do about Hiryu, Admiral Nagumo sent out a comprehensive battle summary to Yamamoto. In it, he described the day's happenings in more detail, noted the damage to his ships, but still opined that Hiryu might yet be able to be saved. However, even as his superior was informing Yamamoto of these matters, Yamaguchi was preparing to play out his final act. In contrast to Nagumo, Yamaguchi had concluded the carrier was beyond salvation. At 2.30am he ordered the crew assembled in preparation of abandoning ship. By 2.50am, the remaining crew nearly 800 men were gathered on the flight deck near the bridge. The bridge was smouldering, and fires still burned in the hangar deck forward, casting a weird light on the proceedings. As soon as all were assembled, Captain Kaku and the Admiral addressed the men. Kaku spoke first, exhorting them to carry on the fight. They would, he was sure, become the core of an increasingly powerful Japanese navy. Yamaguchi then went on to say that he was proud of Hiryu's crew. He placed the loss of Hiryu and Soryu solely on his own head, and as atonement for those failings, he intended to stay on board to the end. The rest of the men, he commanded, were to abandon ship and carry on their loyal service to the Emperor. Next, Yamaguchi ordered the men to face west toward Tokyo, and three bonsais were issued. Last of all, Hiryu's battle ensign and the Admiral's flag were lowered. There was an ominous braying of bugles the ship's crew were playing Kimigayo, Japan's national anthem, as the flags were taken down for the last time. It has been noted by another historian that your average Western admiral would surely have forgone the necessity of keeping 800 crewmen standing around for over half an hour on a flaming, badly listing carrier, while he indulged his taste for melodrama. But in Japan it's important to observe the niceties, regardless of the immediate circumstances surrounding them. Even the wounded were in attendance. Bomber Maintenance Chief Arimura Despite his serious injuries, remembered watching the flags come down from where he lay on the flight deck. Now, with the ceremonies concluded at 3.15am, Captain Kaku finally gave the order for the exodus to get underway. There was no panic. Arimura was carried to the aft end of the flight deck with the other injured men. He was terribly thirsty and called out for water. His punctured lung was turning every breath into a bloody froth, and one of the men nearby said that if he drank any water, he would die. 
Another sailor demurred, saying, Yosh, it'll be all right, and instead handed Arimura a beer. If the maintenance chief were destined shortly for the hereafter, it would be far better to meet it on terms of equanimity. Arimura, however, had no intention of giving up the ghost just yet, and to him the beer was the very nectar of the gods. Makigumo was waiting alongside the carrier's port side, like Kazagumo before her. Hiryu's overhanging flight deck demolished her mainmast in the process. First over the side was a lieutenant, clutching the emperor's portrait. Next came the wounded. Arimura was tied to a board and lowered to the destroyer's deck. The wounded were soon packed into every available spot. They were being attended to as best Makigumo's crew might, but the conditions for providing decent care were far from ideal. Flight Lieutenant Kadano Hiroshi, Hiryu's third section attack aircraft Buntaicho, was a typical case. His kanko had been damaged in the morning strike on Midway, and his leg had been badly shot up by American fighters. Now the corpsman told him the limb had to come off. The only available space for the amputation was the deck in one of Makigumo's heads. With the crew in the process of debarking, Yamaguchi said goodbye to his staff. It was at this point that Captain Kaku announced that he too was going to share Hiryu's fate. Yamaguchi understood his sentiments. Let us enjoy the beauty of the moon, the admiral intoned. How brightly it shines, agreed Hiryu's skipper. It must be in its twenty-first day. Lieutenant Commander Kiyuma Takeo, Carrier Division 2's engineering staff officer, took this opportunity to intercede with Captain Ito, Yamaguchi's chief of staff. Surely, Kuma said, the Admiral's staff ought to try to rescue him, even if they had to do it by force. Ito demurred, saying that even if the staff physically carried him off the ship, the strong-willed Admiral would surely kill himself later. Yamaguchi having declared his intention to stay on board, Ito felt that the thoughtful way would be to let him do as he wishes. Thereupon, Ito approached Yamaguchi directly declaring that the admiral's staff had decided that they wished to stay with him to the end. Yamaguchi would have none of it. I am very pleased and touched by the staff's desire to remain with me. But you young men must leave the ship. This is my order. The same stern reply was given to Hiryu's executive officer, Commander Kanui Takashi, when he suggested that the carrier's senior officers should stay with Captain Kaku. Failing mass self-termination attempt, Kiyuma suggested to Chief of Staff Ito that they ask the Admiral for a souvenir to remember him by. Yamaguchi swept off his cap, handing it to Ito, the Admiral and his staff then drank a final toast of farewell. The ship's paymaster noted that there was still a lot of money in the ship's safe and wondered what ought to be done with it. Leave it where it is, Captain Kaku said. We'll need it to cross the river sticks, to which Yamaguchi piped in. That's right. We'll need it for a square meal in hell, Ito asked if the Admiral had any final messages before they departed. Yes, responded Yamaguchi. He told Admiral Nagumo that I have no words to apologize for what has happened. I only wish for a stronger Japanese navy and revenge. The second message was for Captain Abe Toshio, the commander of Destroyer Division 10 in Kazagumo. Scuttle hear you with your torpedoes. The speechmaking was now at an end and Ito and the others departed. But it was not until 4.30am that all of Hiryu's crew finally left the ship, with Ito and Kiyuma being the last off. As Kiyuma climbed down a rope into a small boat, he lost his composure at the prospect of losing the greatest man he had ever met in his whole life. He had been on the Admiral's staff since December 1940, and was the longest-serving staff member in Yamaguchi's entourage. Looking back at the still-burning Hiryu, he could see Kaku and Yamaguchi standing on the bridge, waving. What happened to the captain and admiral after that is anyone's guess. They certainly could not have made their way below to their cabins, as these were in the bow of the ship, which was wrecked by the fires. Where Kaku and Yamaguchi met their end will remain forever unknown. At 5.10am, with the sun already rising in the east, Makigumo prepared to carry out Yamaguchi's final wish. Kazagumo was already departing, leaving just Hiryu's plane guard destroyer to do the deed. As a precaution, Makigumo's navigator, Lieutenant Commander Tamura, was sent back to the carrier to ensure that everyone was off the vessel. Climbing back on board, he made his way to the bridge, 
but found no one there. Tamura returned to Makigumo. The loudspeakers suddenly blared out on the destroyer. We are right now going to torpedo and sink Hiryu. Battle stations torpedo port side. Target Hiryu bearing 90 degrees. Prepare to fire. Everywhere on board men were weeping, her survivors clutching the railings. Makigumo fired a single Type 93 torpedo. It ran too deep and missed her, circling to starboard to double the range. Her skipper, Commander Fujita Isamu, fired a second. This one hit fairly far forward, near the ship's starboard bow gangway. The explosion was spectacular, shoving the carrier's prow out of the water and bouncing it to port. Unusually, there was no huge water column, as was the case with most Type 93 hits. Most likely the fish had struck far enough forward that it had simply blown through the relatively narrow hull structure there, venting much of its force laterally into the water beyond. Whatever the nature of the hit, Commander Fujita apparently judged that Hiryu would not survive it. He turned Makigumo for home. It was at this very juncture that a group of men suddenly appeared on Hiryu's flight deck, waving their deck caps at the departing destroyer. But she did not come about. Fearing air attack as day broke, Commander Fujita apparently judged it better to simply leave the newfound survivors behind. Rather callously, he blinkered back to the men a signal whose meaning is now lost, as none of the survivors on Hiryu's flight deck had the ability to decipher his message, then he cleared the area. This is all rather strange, because Fujita apparently had every opportunity to promptly come about and rescue these hapless survivors in a timely fashion, thus saving destroyer Tanikaze from the rather long, dangerous and ultimately futile mission of mercy that she would be ordered to perform on the morrow. On board Nagara, Nagumo and his staff were grappling with how to atone for their failures in battle. Chief of Staff Kusaka was finally having his burns and other wounds attended to in Nagara's sick bay when his second-in-command, Captain Oishi, approached him. The other staff members had made up their minds to self-termination attempt, Oishi said, and he urged Kusaka to convince Nagumo to do the same. In response, Kusaka ordered Oishi to assemble the staff in the sick bay. Then he laid into them. I am against self-termination, he told them firmly. His voice rising, he continued, You are just like hysterical women. First you get excited over easy victories, and now you are worked up to taking your life because of a defeat. This is no time for Japan for you to say such a thing. Why not think of turning a misfortune into a blessing through your efforts? He ended by saying that he was going to tell Nagumo of his opinion. Kusaka was as good as his word, and went to find Nagumo in his cabin. The commander of First Air Fleet, to Kusaka, appeared very downcast. Kusaka wasted no time in strongly voicing his opinions that taking one's life would solve nothing, and that Japan needed them to continue their efforts. Nagumo didn't perk up noticeably, replying to Kusaka that he appreciated his advice, but adding, You must understand that everything a commander-in-chief does cannot be by reason. To Kusaka, this clearly indicated that Nagumo was still contemplating self-termination. Come on, he continued, what can you accomplish with a defeatist attitude? Nagumo at this point relented. Very well, I will never commit a rash act. In fact, there is every indication that Nagumo never rallied completely from this stunning defeat. His son recalled afterward that the Admiral said nothing of Midway until 1944, when he was about to depart for the island of Saipan to take command of its garrison. After swearing them to secrecy, he conveyed the news of the terrible calamity to his two sons. Breaking into tears as he relayed his story, he described the destruction of his force and the slaughter of his men. Nagumo left shortly thereafter and would never return to Japan, eventually taking one's life as the final defence of Saipan collapsed around him. Nagumo's former flagship was about to meet her demise, much like her fires. The debate over what to do with Akagi had sputtered fitfully all night on board Yamato. Now, as dawn approached, the argument blazed up again. Had the Americans been defeated by Kondo's eastward rush, it was conceivable that they could have towed Akagi back to Japan. Indeed, even as late as 2.20 a.m., Kondo had radioed Captain Ariga of Destroyer Division 4, asking Ariga to inform condition of Akagi immediately. However, with daylight coming on, American air power would clearly prevent Akagi's being saved. To Captain Kurashima, 
Akagi's impending demise was symbolic of the ruination of the operation as a whole. It was simply unthinkable that the flagship should be scuttled. Weeping in frustration, he shouted, We cannot sink the Emperor's warships with the Emperor's own torpedoes. Staff Officer Watanabe remembered that with Kuroshima's anguished outburst, virtually all the members of Yamamoto's staff choked and stopped breathing. It had been a long night, and Combined Fleet staff was at the point of emotional collapse. To Chief of Staff Ugaki, Akagi's miserable fate was, of course, a cause for great regret. He couldn't help shedding a few tears for his commander-in-chief, guessing Yamamoto's feelings for his old ship. Yet, in the end, as Ugaki realised, sentiment is sentiment, and reason is reason. Yamamoto concluded the same thing. To do otherwise was to unnecessarily risk the other units still around her, or worse yet, to potentially allow her to fall into enemy hands. When he finally spoke, it was in grave, deliberate tones. I was once the captain of Akagi, he said, and it is with heartfelt regret that I must now order that she be sunk. Answering Kuroshima's concerns over the manner of her disposal, he added, I will apologise to the Emperor for the sinking of Akagi by our own torpedoes. At 4.50am, the word finally came down to Captain Arigar that Akagi was to be scuttled, some seventeen and a half hours after the beginning of her ordeal. Each ship of Destroyer Division 4 was to fire a Type 93 torpedo from a distance of between 1,000 and 1,500 metres. Ariga's flagship Arashi formed Nawaki, Hagikaze and Maikaze into line behind her, and they passed up Akagi's starboard side from astern at 12 knots. Not unlike soldiers in a firing squad, each destroyer launched a single torpedo as they swept by, then Ariga's formation cut in front of Akagi's bow, heading north to rejoin Nagumo. Two or three torpedoes slammed into the carrier's starboard side, heaving enormous waterspouts into the air. When the mist subsided, the men crowded along the railings could see Akagi quietly bowing her proud head in surrender to the sea. As she nosed under, Everyone on board the destroyers broke into shouts of Banzai, Akagi Banzai, by 5.20 a.m. Japan's most famous carrier lifted her stern into the air, briefly exposing her mighty propellers. Then she was gone, as if pulled down by a huge hand as Maikaze's commanding officer described it, carrying 267 crewmen with her into the abyss. Nothing but enormous bubbles remained on the surface to mark her grave, the morning sun rising over Nagara's stern mocked the limp national standard hanging there. Even as Akagi was sliding down into oblivion, Nagara's bow was pointed west, carrying Nagumo ever closer to the main body. Around the diminutive flagship clustered a sadly shrunken formation. Kirishima and Haruna, now the largest ships in Nagumo's fleet, plodded stolidly along on either side. All around Nagara, their decks carpeted with survivors, paced the force's destroyers. The carrier men, still in shock from the previous day's ordeal, had spent the night sleeping exposed on the tan linoleum decks of their former escorts. Now, with light creeping over the horizon, they continued to lie where they had fallen, too exhausted or injured to move. Nagumo's flight operations commenced at dawn, but they were a pale shadow of yesterday's undertakings. On board the cruisers and battleships, solitary engines coughed to life, echoing hollowly over the water. It was nothing like the dull roar of entire squadrons that had thrummed with life the day before. At 4.41am, Chikuma sent up her number one and number four aircraft to make sure the Americans weren't following their retreat. It wasn't much in the way of air power, but it would have to do, for far from going into his shell, Nagumo was actually looking for openings to renew the battle with what meagre assets were left to him. No fighters would be overhead this day, and the weather was clear. Men that had cursed the fog a few days earlier now prayed for its return. Defeated, Nagumo and his men knew they had no choice now but to steel themselves for whatever dreadful consequences might accrue from their current state. If American carrier aircraft found them now, they would be almost powerless to repel their attacks. These same men remembered running rampant through their beaten foes just a few months before. Allied warships in the waters around Java, merchant ships and pleasure craft packed with civilians trying to flee the impending falls of Singapore and Surabaja, they had cut them all down like wolves among the sheep. Now the tables were turned, and it was the worst feeling in the world, 
they could expect no mercy. On board Yamato, Admiral Yamamoto had also rallied somewhat. Though he knew that the odds were distinctly against him, he had decided to try to salvage what he could from the situation. However, he had precious little to work with. His forces were essentially devoid of air cover, whereas the Americans now possessed total air supremacy. Even when Kondo and Nagumo rejoined his fleet, he would have to contend with a dwindling fuel supply. Nagumo's ships would be packed with survivors, many of them wounded. And he had no clear idea of the enemy's intentions. Nevertheless, he retained enough of a sense of opportunism to recognize that since the American carriers were near at hand, operations in the Aleutians could proceed unmolested. Kakuta's carriers would continue steaming south, of course, but Hosogaya's northern force could invade Kiska and Atu, albeit this couldn't occur until the 7th. Hosogaya's force already had the same idea and asked permission to carry out their invasion, despite its being cancelled the previous day. After conferring with his staff, Yamamoto cut orders authorising what Ugaki termed the Devil May Care landing operations, which resulted in Hosogaya heading northeast once again at 1 a.m. Yamamoto's immediate problem, however, was that Sunrise had found his main body all alone on the high seas, despite the fact that Nagumo's forces were to have joined up with him about this time. Yet even from high atop Yamato's mighty fire control director, there was still no sign of Kido Butai. Kondo at least was on schedule, with his second fleet closing with the main body by 8.15am. Yet Yamamoto was irritated that the rendezvous with Nagumo had failed. Hosho was ordered to launch a few of her old torpedo planes to search for Kido Butai. Yamamoto had little time to waste this morning. He needed to know Mobile Fleet's course and position ASAP if he didn't want confusion to reign over his forces. Dutifully, the ancient little carrier huffed and puffed into the wind, struggling against a rather heavy swell. Her skipper, Captain Umatani Kaoru, would later earn a moment's commendation from Ugaki for completing her duty with a small number of planes in the face of bad weather. One by one, the old torpedo planes rolled down her pitching deck, as Hosho sent forth her small but tangible contribution to the battle's history. One of Hosho's planes discovered Nagumo in short order, steaming a bit to the north and east of Yamamoto's course. After a brisk exchange of messages, Nagumo was able to set a converging course. Chikuma would subsequently sight the reassuring pagoda superstructures of the main body, 37 kilometres distant, at 12.05pm. By 1pm, Cruiser Division 8 was taking station within the main body though the last of the destroyers would not close with Yamamoto till 5pm. However, far more interesting than the discovery of Nagumo's truant force would be a startling encounter had by another of Hosho's planes just a short time later. At around 7am, not long after takeoff, one of these aircraft unexpectedly stumbled across Admiral Yamaguchi's flagship, drifting on the Blue Pacific. Hiryu was still visibly burning but seemed in no immediate danger of sinking. The pilot passed right down her length from bow to stern, then banked back over her starboard beam, with the aircraft's observer taking photographs as they went. His snapshots froze Hiryu near the end of her dreadful ordeal and remain among the most dramatic photographs of the war in the Pacific. Perhaps most amazing of all, the aviators could clearly see men standing on the flight deck, waving their caps. Hosho's plane began tapping out a sighting report at 7.20 a.m. The men in question were the same crewmen who had unsuccessfully tried to flag down Commander Fujita and Makigumo about two hours earlier. They had been understandably heartened to see Hosho's plane. After its departure, these crewmen retreated to the boat deck to await a rescue. However, at around 8.30am, they were surprised to discover that they were not alone. Hearing voices, they went back topside where they unexpectedly encountered a party of over 30 men crouched down on the flight deck. These newcomers were the survivors of Commander Amun Kunizi's engine room gang. Long ago, heat and smoke had driven them from the engine control room containing the voice tube that was their communications lifeline to the bridge. Having lost touch with Staff Engineering Officer Kiuma, the latter had presumed them dead hours before abandoning the ship. Thus, Amun and his men, though far from dead, had been completely unaware of the order to abandon ship.
At 5.10am, they heard and felt the whoomp of Makigumo's torpedo striking home. Having not heard a peep from the bridge in hours, Aemuna judged that it was time to get out of the bowels of the ship. Most of the exits were still blocked, but they had found a way up to the next deck, where a fire was smouldering in the ship's rice storage area. Unfortunately, there was apparently no way out from the long corridor they were trapped in. The hatches at either end were blocked. Finally, one of the men spotted light coming from one of the welds. Where fire or shrapnel had punched a small hole in the bulkhead, they were peeping into the ship's lower hangar deck, lit by dim sunlight. Amun wasted no time in sending someone back below to fetch a hammer and chisel. If they couldn't find an exit, they'd make one instead. Eventually, they managed to chisel a narrow opening large enough for a man to climb through. Making their way into the hangar after 8am, they found everything deserted and strangely quiet. Fires were still burning here and there, but more unnerving was the sunlight streaming into the hangar through the enormous hole that had been blown in the flight deck. Finally making their way topside and looking about, they could see that the ship had been abandoned hours before. Commander Aemun, Ensign Mandai and the men were understandably furious and dejected. Worse, the men could see water slowly swirling onto the hangar deck forward. Ineffective as Makigumo's hit had been, Hiryu clearly wasn't going to float forever. To Commander Aemun, the situation appeared hopeless. Dropping onto the flight deck, he thanked the men for their good efforts and prepared for the end. Ensign Mandai, utterly spent by the long night's action, dozed off only to be awakened by the small band of survivors from Hiryu's fantail. They quickly reported the exciting news of a Japanese plane having flown overhead earlier. It was clear from their description that it had been a carrier aircraft, it even had fixed landing gear. This unexpected news gave Amun's party renewed hope. If there had been a Japanese carrier aircraft overhead, they might be rescued yet. The problem was that Hiryu was beginning to sink noticeably by the bow, they didn't have much time left to escape. Leading the party down to the ship's fantail, Imune found two launches still lashed to the deck, and a thirty-foot cutter already in the water immediately astern the ship. They set to work freeing the launches, but Hiryu began pitching down to take her final plunge. Imune told the men to jump in and swim for the cutter. Over the side they went, Ensign Mandai hit the water and dove deep. When he made it back to the surface, he looked over his shoulder in awe. There were Hiryu's giant propellers, coming up out of the water over his head, flashing wetly in the sun. He turned and swam like the devil, not wanting to be sucked under as Hiryu went to her grave. The next time he looked back, she was gone, carrying 392 of her crew with her. Shortly thereafter, an enormous undersea rumble announced her final demise. Aemune and 38 of the men made it into the cutter. Their watches had all stopped working between 9.07am and 9.15am, putting a reasonable time box around the moment of Hiryu's final sinking. The men found the cutter stocked with hardtack, water, tallow and beer. They were confident that Yamamoto would return for them soon, but in fact they would be adrift for the next 14 days, until being spotted by an American PBY and recovered by the seaplane tender Ballard on 19 June. Along the way they suffered many hardships. Four of the men died of their wounds or exposure before being rescued. A fifth died the night after being brought on board Ballard. Commander A. Muni, for all his wiliness in getting his men out of Hiryu's bowels, demonstrated less concern for them once they were in the boat together. Despite their dire collective circumstances, he insisted on consuming more than his fair share of the food and beer. While he didn't know it at the time, he very nearly ended up as shark chum as a result of his insensitivity. A thirty-foot open boat drifting on the Pacific was rather a misguided place to pull rank over an extra bottle or two of Asahi Biru. As it happened, the Americans were having their own problems this morning, and many of them stemmed from submarine timber. For one thing, she had not managed to launch a torpedo attack against the cripples of Cruiser Division 7. Megami's 12-knot speed of advance had proved enough, barely, for the Japanese ships to stay ahead of the submerged American submarine. More critically, as mentioned previously, Tambor's skipper, Lieutenant Commander John Murphy, had failed to describe the enemy's course or speed of advance adequately, leaving Raymond Spruance, 
He didn't receive Murphy's message until 4 a.m. in the dark concerning the Japanese forces' intentions. The time from midnight to dawn was critical in positioning Spruance's forces for the following day's operations. He had kept what they felt to be a safe distance throughout the night, intending to avoid entanglements with any Japanese forces in the area. Spruance personally didn't believe that the Japanese force Tambor had spotted would still be intent on attacking the island after the pummeling they had taken on the 4th. But the potential downside of being wrong wasn't worth the risk. As such, he didn't come westward until he knew the Japanese were retreating, which Tambor did not relay until after 6 a.m. Had Spruance had this information in hand sooner, it would have measurably increased his odds of inflicting greater harm on the enemy than was to be the case. Nimitz, an ex-submariner, was understandably furious with Murphy's performance, subsequently relieving him of command. In fact, the American submarines as a whole had performed poorly, of twelve boats. Only Nautilus, the oldest of the lot, had actually managed to attack the enemy. Beyond not being optimally positioned for launching follow-up operations, American air power was also badly depleted. Midway's various squadrons, except for the PBYs, had been savaged. The Marines were down to just four fighters and about twelve dive bombers. Many of the other aircraft left on the atoll were either unflyable junk or too badly shot up to participate in combat. Midway had in fact been flying damaged aircraft back to Hawaii during the night. A flight of four B-17s were waiting to take off, even as Tanabe's I-168 had been shelling the lagoon. Dawn on the 5th therefore found the atoll's air power nearly crippled. Based on Tambor's initial reports, though, the first item of business for Midway was to attempt to localise the Japanese units Murphy had sighted. Midway's Catalinas began taking off at 4.15am, fanning out in an arc to the west from 0 to 0 degrees to 250 degrees. Today, though, the PBYs would only search out to 250 miles. Captain Cyril Simard's primary concern was ensuring that the atoll was not about to be invaded. If an invasion fleet materialised, the PBYs in the air needed the endurance to return all the way to Pearl Harbour without refuelling. This had serious repercussions for Spruance, though, as it essentially deprived his carriers of longer-ranged scouting assets. In so doing, Simard also lessened the odds of Spruance's locating Nagumo and Yamamoto. Spruance's own air formations were scarcely in better shape than Midway's. Split between Hornet and Enterprise were a total of around 60 attack aircraft, plus fighters about a full carrier's worth. The Japanese would surely have traded places with him this morning, but Spruance's hand was not strong enough for him to want to push his luck. While he had sufficient dauntlesses in hand to project meaningful firepower, many of them would need to be devoted to scouting activities. Beyond locating and attacking the Japanese, the other major task was trying to save Yorktown. Under the Hughes's watchful presence, she had survived the night, and by morning appeared to be in no worse shape than she had been twelve hours earlier. Her commanding officer, Captain Elliot Buckmaster, had meanwhile succeeded in convincing Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher that the carrier could still be saved. He wanted to put a hand-picked party of salvagers on board the carrier, try and restore power, and get her out of the area, Fletcher assented. In fact, on the night of the 4th, Chester Nimitz had already ordered minesweeper Virio and the fleet Tug Navajo, which were at Pearl and Hermes Reef, and French frigate Shoals, respectively, to begin moving toward Yorktown. Unfortunately, the men Buckmaster felt he needed were scattered across all the various vessels of Task Force 17, which had rescued the carrier's crew. Transferring them onto the destroyer, Hammond took until 11.27 a.m., at which point she began heading back toward Yorktown. Back on board Yamato, Hosho's sighting report of Hiryu reached a flabbergasted Yamamoto and Ugaki at around 7.30 a.m. Yamato flashed a message to Nagumo. Has the Hiryu sunk, advise of developments and position. For his part, Nagumo was just as confused by the news as his superiors. At 8.20 a.m., the word flashed out to Tanikaze, According to reconnaissance by Hosho Plain at 7.20 a.m., the Hiryu was burning in position. A number of survivors were on deck, investigating conditions and taking off survivors. Commander Katsumi Motoi duly swung his ship out of formation 
and raced eastward back toward Hiryu and the enemy. As events would prove, she was to have a long dangerous day atoning unfairly for her sister's earlier mistakes. Scarcely had word about Hiryu's mysterious non-sinking been received than news reached Nagumo concerning another derelict. At 6.52am, a garbled message from Chikuma's number 4 search plane had been intercepted by Nagara. It seemed to mention an enemy carrier. At 8am, Chikuma blinkered a full rebroadcast to Nagara. Number 4 had sighted an enemy Yorktown-class carrier listing to starboard and drifting in position, bearing 111 degrees, distance 240 miles from my takeoff point. One destroyer is in the vicinity, in due course, Word went out to Tanabe's I-168, which was still loitering near Midway. He shortly set a new course to the northeast. It would take him a day to reach his new target, but from all reports, it didn't look as if this particular American carrier was going any place soon. The Americans were beginning to get back their own scouting reports by now. At 6.30am, a PBY picked up Mogami's and Mikuma's trails. In Mikuma's case, there literally was a trail as she was streaming a ribbon of bunker oil from her damaged fuel tanks. This PBY transmitted that it had detected two battleships, bearing 264, 125 miles from Midway, on a course of 265 at a speed of 15 knots. A second PBY amplified this report, describing two large capital ships, both damaged, and one leaking oil. Captain Sakiyama of Mikuma was well aware they had been sighted, sending word to his superiors at 6.23 a.m. that his position was 28 degrees 10 minutes north, 179 degrees 30 minutes west, speed 12 knots. Though Mikuma was capable of nearly full speed, Sakiyama was loath to abandon Sister Mogami. Whatever attacks came, Sakiyama resolved that he and Soji would face them together. They both knew that the main Japanese forces were well to the north and west at this time, but Captain Sakiyama had wisely opted to steer due west so as to put as much ocean between them and their enemies as possible. There would be time enough later to figure out how to rejoin the main body. The sight of an American PBY at 6.30am, though, meant that the jig was up far sooner than either ship would have wished. Midway lost no time in attacking the cripples, ordering the remnants of Marine Scout Bombing Squadron 241 to take off immediately. At 7am, Captain Marshal Zack Tyler, the squadron's third commander in two days, led out a flight of a dozen dive bombers, six dauntlesses, and a like number of Scout Bomber 2U, divided into two sections. About 40 miles away from the target, the Marine aviators easily picked up Mikuma's glistening exudation and turned to follow it. Shortly thereafter, the two Japanese ships hove into view, Captain Tyler's dauntless squadron attacked from out of the sun at 10,000 feet. The older Vindicators, led by Captain Richard Fleming, opted for a glide bombing attack from 4,000 feet. Mikuma and Mogami, despite their damage and very low speed, proceeded to throw up a veritable torrent of anti-aircraft fire. Tyler's men went first, but Mogami's heavy fire meant all they could manage was to sequentially deposit their bombs in the water alongside the cruiser. Next came Fleming's men. They focused their attack on Mikuma, which was on Mogami's port bow, and were subjected to a similarly withering barrage. This time, though, the Japanese drew blood, as Captain Fleming's aircraft was struck almost at the outset of his dive. He attempted to control his aircraft, but went flaming into the ocean. Accounts vary as to whether pilot or gunner attempted to get out of their aircraft, neither survived. One thing that is clear, though, is that despite popular folklore to the contrary, Captain Fleming did not crash his aircraft onto Mikuma's number no. 4 turret. The most reliable witnesses on the American side attest that his plane crashed into the sea, and the only Japanese source to ever state that Fleming hit the ship was in no position to witness the event. The rest of Fleming's section all missed the cruiser with their bombs. The net result was that both Japanese cruisers emerged unscathed from their first ordeal. However, more trouble was not long in coming. Almost as soon as the American dive bombers had been seen off, a pack of eight B-17 showed up. Under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Brook E. Allen, these came in at 20,000 feet in two elements of four aircraft each. Once again, 
The big four-engined bombers merely deposited a total of 39 500-pound bombs harmlessly in the drink, mostly around Mogami. Mikuma triumphantly signalled, although attacked by eight B-17s at 8.34am, we drove them off without damage. So far, at least, their luck had held out. If this was the best that 20 American bombers could manage against 12 knot targets, they might make it out yet. Indeed, as if buoyed by her good fortune, Mogami at 11.30am cranked up to 14 knots. Task Force 16 had the same information in hand as Simard, and might have attacked Mogami and Makuma as well. But Spruance was far more interested in knowing if there were any remaining Japanese carriers to the northwest of the island. While waiting for a clearer picture to emerge, he turned due west at 9.30am, passing only 50 miles north of Midway. He was now in a perfect position to foil any renewed landing attempt while evaluating the morning's reports. However, instead of a clearer picture emerging, things began to get more confusing as the morning wore on. At 7am, Midway radioed that a PBY had detected two enemy cruisers bearing 286, distance 174, course 310, speed 20 knots. Though Spruance didn't know it, this was Kurita's Kumano and Suzuya steaming to rejoin Kondo. At 8am, another report was received, detailing two enemy battleships, three or four cruisers, one aircraft carrier on fire bearing 324 distance 240 miles from midway course 310 speed 12. In retrospect, the carrier was plainly Hiryu, although it is less apparent what other vessels were in her vicinity that could have been sighted. But that wasn't all. At 8.53 a.m. another PBY sighted a carrier bearing 335 distance 250, from midway course 245 at 8.20 p.m. GCT, 8.20, local. Finally, at 9.07 a.m., midway rebroadcast the following, 2,000 enemy cruisers, auxiliaries and some destroyers screening burning carrier two battleships well ahead of group. To Spruance and his staff, the overall impression was that there was indeed an enemy carrier still out there, on the basis of the reports they already had in hand, they were convinced that Akagi, Kaga and Soryu had been dispatched. But so far as they knew, Hiryu had only been crippled, and no one would discount the possibility that an undiscovered fifth Japanese carrier still lurked nearby. Accordingly, Spruance decided to leave Midway to the business of dealing with the two battleships while he sought bigger prey to the northwest. In the event, though, Spruance didn't end up getting a strike-off until around 3.12pm. It would have been launched an hour sooner, had not a rather bizarre incident occurred on Enterprise's bridge. Captain Miles Browning, Spruance's chief of staff, drafted an attack plan that called for launching the force's scout bomber Douglas at 2pm. During the briefing, Enterprise's aviators were informed that they would be launching at a range of 240 miles from the contact extreme range for the Dauntless. Worse yet, upon closer examination, Browning's plan failed to account for the distance that the Japanese warships would most likely have moved in the interval from launch, meaning that the actual range was closer to 275 miles. Browning had also specified that the planes were to be armed with 1,000-pound weapons, decreasing their effective range still further. Lieutenant Shumway, slated to lead Enterprise's attack, was concerned enough about the outlines of the plan that he took them to Enterprise's air group commander, Wade McCluskey, who was lying in the ship's sick bay. McCluskey promptly went ballistic, though wounded, he made his way up to the flag bridge, dragging Earl Gallagher and Enterprise's skipper, Captain George Murray, along with him. He confronted Browning in front of Spruance, contending that the mission could not be carried out as planned. Browning, without explanation, brusquely ordered the aviators to carry out their orders. McCluskey thereupon inquired if Browning had ever flown a scout bomber Douglas. Browning answered that he had. McCluskey then pressed him on whether he had ever flown a late model scout bomber Douglas, equipped with self-sealing tanks which carried less fuel, armoured seats, a 1,000-pound bomb, and a full load of avgas. Browning admitted he hadn't. The argument quickly turned openly hostile, whereupon Spruance sided with McCluskey, saying simply, I will do what you pilots want. 
Clearly, Spruance had discerned from the previous day's events that his senior aviators knew their business. Browning stormed off the flag bridge in a rage, sulking in his cabin until another staff member persuaded him to return to his duties. The upshot of this almost farcical episode was that Enterprise's aircraft, and Hornets too, had to be rearmed with 500-pound weapons before the strike went on. By the time the switch-out had occurred, middle afternoon was wasting away. Enterprise launched 32 Scout Bomber Douglas at 3.12pm. Hornet sent up 11 aircraft at 3.30pm, followed by 21 shortly thereafter at 3.43pm. Incredibly, despite the new arming orders, seven of Hornet's scouts still carried 1,000-pound bombs. Commander Stanhope Ring, leader of Hornet's ignominious combat debut the day before, once again led her attack and commanded the lead element. Lieutenant Commander Walter F. Rohde was in charge of Hornet's second group, including the overloaded planes of Scout Squadron 8. All three strikes targeted the same burning carrier, the Hiryu, of course. Hiryu had already sunk. However, there was a Japanese ship entering Ring's bullseye, destroyer Tanikaze. She was still retracing Nagumo's earlier retreat, searching vainly for Yamaguchi and his flagship. In fact, Tanikaze had already been swiped at by some planes from Midway. At 4.36pm, a quintet of B-17s had dropped bombs on her. All of them landed clear on either side of the bows, and Tanikaze suffered only a drenching of her superstructure. Undeterred, Commander Katsumi continued on his way. But 70-odd minutes later, Ring's 12 scout bomber Douglas appeared in the skies above the destroyer. Ring had spotted Tanikaze at 5.15pm, identifying her as a light cruiser as it developed. Both Hornets and Enterprise's planes were to consistently identify Tanikaze as a light cruiser this day. It is likely that dusk conditions, as well as the fact Kagero-class destroyers sported an oversized forward stack, may have compounded this impression. But Ring's assigned target was much bigger a carrier and her escorts, so for the moment he pressed on, leaving Tanikaze behind.